I'm very glad here to represent the uh, uh, the uh, our you know uh, researchers who are working on the uh, coexistence with passive receivers, and in, in in this specific context, I'm talking about radio astronomy devices uh, and telescopes. Um, over the last couple of years, I've had the great pleasure to work with uh, uh, some radio astronomers here at the U of A who kind of uh, educated me significantly on the, you know, the value of radio astronomy and the importance of uh, protecting their spectrum. Uh, so, so this is uh, started as a dialogue of, of trying to explore the frontiers of uh, spectrum sharing and coexistence with passive receivers, and I'll talk about some of the ideas that we have for the uh, for this effort, for this proposed effort. Uh, and in the process, we have conducted various measurements on the type of interference that matters, um, and exploring basically what possibilities can be done to make a, a wireless and radio astronomy partnership a win-win uh, type of partnership. Uh, let me share my. I think I'm sharing, but let me just go to the slide mode here. Uh, so uh, lots of credit goes to the collaborators here from the U of A, uh, uh, Professor Chris, uh, Chris Walker, Dr. Allison Ford, George Leyland, Amir Yazdani, and Tom Falkers, who contributed uh, uh, significantly to the slides I'm going to present today. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm not a radio astronomer, but as I mentioned, I was just uh, thrilled by, um, you know, what radio astronomy has provided over the years. And just to put the context of what we mean by passive receivers, obviously here, passive receivers could mean uh, two things, you know, radio astronomy telescopes, which would be the focus of my talk, as well as satellite sensors uh, that are used to monitor various, you know, earth exploration, weather and deep space, which uh, we're not concerned, at least for the time being, for the sake of this presentation, I'm not going to talk much about it. So my focus will be primarily on coexistence with uh, radio astronomy telescopes. Uh, here at the U of A, there are two telescopes that we've been uh, um, conducting measurements on. Uh, the one is the submillimeter, uh, submillimeter wave telescope, or SMT, uh, on, at Mount Graham. This is almost four, four hours here from Tucson. And the other is closer at the Kitt Peak. Some of you who visited Tucson may have actually came to the Kitt Peak and, and uh, did some observation. Uh, we refer to this as the 12 millimeter telescope or the ALMA prototype uh, telescope. Uh, we've done some uh, pilot studies to measure uh, some you know, interference from Wi-Fi at the SMT. Uh, we've done some also, uh, um, you know, some measurements at very recent measurements actually at the Kitt Peak to, to also look into the forms of interference and whether they're harmful or not. And I'll, I'll be talking about that. So, uh, you know, for those of you who are not familiar with radio astronomy, I mean, this is something that, that obviously, you know, we, we, get, we, we hear a lot about it in the news. Uh, but, but the science of radio astronomy is actually goes back to, you know, um, almost, uh, you know, uh, short of 100 years ago uh, with uh, Jansky's, uh, you know, discovery of uh, uh, radio waves coming from uh, outer space. Uh, interestingly, actually, Jansky was a, an engineer at, at uh, Bell Labs at Homedale. He was really not interested in radio astronomy per se, but he was interested in looking at the best times to measure interference for a transatlantic, um, you know, mic, you know, um, uh, shortwave uh, communications. Uh, so in the process of doing that, you know, he looked, he started looking for interference and that actually sparked the, the you know, the, you know, modern uh, radio astronomy science. Uh, but radio astronomy has provided significant contributions over the years, um, you know, from the mapping of the uh, uh, from the first imaging or mapping of the Milky Way, uh, you know, galaxy, um, and to the uh, detection of the various um, spectral lines, in particular the hydrogen line, which is probably the most ab abundant uh, element in the universe. And the study of the hydrogen line uh, was used as a basis to actually come up with some very great discoveries 
um, such as you know studying the Milky Way, the uh, you know the expansion and the the composition of the Milky Way. Um, another very interesting, fascinating contribution that that you know I just learned about is really the the, the pulsars. These are um, you know very fast spinning stars of neur you know neurons. Um, you know, they spin in, in the time scale of milliseconds, actually, and they create, a, you know, a very strong electromagnetic uh, signature that can be observed using radio astronomy systems. Now, very recently, some of you probably have, you know, are familiar with some of the very big discovery, uh, including the, you know, the imaging of the, you know, the, fir the first supermassive uh, black hole in the M87 um, galaxy. And I think there was a big article about it in a number of IEEE magazines. The IEEE spectrum had uh, a very uh, um, uh, long and, and uh, insightful um, presentation about, about that discovery. So the, the point that I'm trying to make here, obviously, is that the science of radio astronomy is quite essential to understanding the universe. And any discussion about uh, uh, coexistence and spectrum sharing uh, with radio astronomy systems must take into account, you know, all their needs in terms of, uh, um, you know, sensitivity of their devices and so on. Um, one thing that that is important to emphasize here is that radio astronomy spectral lines and as well as continuum radiation span you know, all of the RF spectrum, you know, starting from very low frequencies and going all the way to hundreds of gigahertz. Uh, and, and, you know, quite often they have, um, you know, their uh, allocated frequencies, uh, protected bands, and, but in some cases they don't have a primary access to these bands. So they can access the band on a shared or, or, or secondary basis according to FCC and NTIA rules. So it's, it's very important to kind of keep this in mind and, and uh, the fact that in some cases, some of these spectral lines will actually uh, shift to, to, to spectrum that is not necessarily allocated to um, radio astronomy, but, but given the significance of these spectral lines and, and you know, to accommodate their shift, uh, some effort uh, can be done to accommodate them in terms of uh, spectrum coexistence. Now, um, you know, based on the current allocation of the spectrum, um, this is kind of a, uh, the, the figure to the left just shows where's the, you know, as of recent, the radio astronomy allocations in the United States. And as I mentioned, you know, it spans all, all uh, you know, all of the radio frequency spectrum that we are aware, that we were concerned with up to 300 gigahertz and beyond. Um, there are actually much of the allocation is happening above uh, above 100 gigahertz, uh, but there's still many lines and, and many allocations that are available either exclusively or on a shared basis, uh, or sometimes on a secondary basis, you know, throughout the, um, the, the RF, the spectrum map. Um, to the left here, I'm showing the fraction of the allocation that has been set aside for uh, radio astronomy. Uh, it is very critical here, I mean, for those of us coming from the wireless community to kind of uh, understand and appreciate the level of uh, sensitivity that, uh, you know, radio astronomy systems have in regard to RF interference. Uh, it's actually one of the probably, you know, contentious aspects that quite often we see, we hear about, um, you know, uh, or one of the obstacles in regard to coexistence, which we think we can address and tackle in, in, in this effort. Uh, so, you know, RF interference is a quite an issue. It's been studied by various observatories. And as I mentioned, we're, I'm going to show some of our data that we collected here and as part of a pilot study. Uh, they, are depend, they, they depend on the specific type of measurement, um, you know, whether it's spectral line or it's a continuum spectrum and, you know, the integration time of that measurement the antenna and the directionality and all of these factors contribute to the notion of whether the interference is, is too harmful for the radio astronomy measurement to take place or, or not. Um, so <clears throat> there's, I mean, it's important to kind of also distinguish between different types of interference. Um, you know, uh, interference can occur on the sky or the RF frequency, the observation frequency itself. Um, and that is 
more common in the you know sub you know below the 100 gigahertz frequencies where we have various you know terrestrial and and uh, you know active wireless communications taking place but it could also happen at the intermediate frequency uh, given that you know the uh, you know uh, our, RA measurements are often down converted to uh, the C band um, between four and eight gigahertz. And we know that there's a very dense communications, terrestrial communications happening there between Wi-Fi, LTE, uh, DSRC, and many other systems, um, you know, uh, sub six, 5G uh, occurring actually at the IF, at the IF frequency in regard, uh, relative to uh, uh, radio astronomy measurements. And as I mentioned, you know, uh, RFI has been, um, a major concern to various observatories to different degrees. Uh, it's been um, measured and um, you know tabulated by different observatories. This is one study. Uh, I think this is from the um, uh, very you know very large uh, the, the VLA um, uh, telescope showing the interference, the measured interference between one and four gigahertz, you know, in different uh, filters. Uh, in some in some cases, the interference is caused, in many cases, could be caused by external sources, uh, such as wireless systems operating from outside. But in some cases, it could be internal. And one of the challenges has always been, you know, how to actually detect and attribute the source of interference. So uh, for the, the previous table I just showed here, this is some of the, um, uh, this was for the specific uh, VLA uh, measurements taken, um, you know, over the one to four gigahertz band, where they were able to attribute the source of interference to, you know, different uh, systems. But sometimes it's it's harder to actually uh, know where this interference is coming from, what's the source of the interference, and how to localize uh, that interference. So here at the University of Arizona, we've been uh, we started with you know with this pilot study looking into RFI measurements, and uh, um, you know, the two primary observatories, the telescopes that we've been focusing on are part of the a unit at the U of A called the Arizona Radio Observatory. It's, it's a unit within the Stewart Observatory and Department of Astronomy here at the U of A. Uh, there are two telescopes. The one I mentioned, the, the Kitt Peak Telescope. It's a 12 meter ALMA prototype telescope that uh, measures from our observations done between uh, from 66 gigahertz and upward. Uh, and the submillimeter telescope, which is, uh, you know, this is, this, this is a famous telescope, uh, was used for part of the Event Horizon uh, telescope um, that was used to basically the, um, to, uh, to, ma to, to map or to image the supermassive uh, black hole. Uh, and, you know, we do have access to so, you know, to these telescopes, now there are usually uh, certain uh, restrictions and constraints in terms of um, the placement of, um, you know, measuring devices. Uh, both telescopes are on tribal land, so we had to kind of keep this in mind, uh, you know, um, where, where, where sensors as well as, uh, let's say, experimental radio devices can be placed. Uh, plus the fact that, you know, there's a, the, the schedule of these telescopes in terms of when they're conducting science measurements is, you know, is quite uh, loaded. So quite often we rely on or, or we conduct our experiments during uh, what, what they call as the engineering times or the maintenance times of these telescopes where the receivers may still be operational, but there is no science uh, measurement that is planned or being scheduled uh, during that time. Uh, U of A has also some other telescopes under construction, uh, which they may or may not be used for the purposes of this project. Uh, one of them is called the Arizona Array. It's a six element VLBI. You, should, you see it here on the left. Um, and um, um, you know, my colleague Chris Walker is, and, and Allison are, are hev heavily involved in, in this effort. It's still under construction. You see some of the pictures here on the, in the middle. Uh, this is one of the telescopes. I think this is the one at the bio, Biosphere 2 site being built. Uh, I think this is last month, picture from last month. The one on the right is another uh, element. Um, this, this one is in uh, Colorado, in Centennial, Colorado. In total, there are six of them. And again, this is still an ongoing effort. Purpose of this project is to 
conduct passive observations of telecom uh, signals and locate satellites, um, you know, uh, various using various uh, multi-static radar techniques. Here's um, just kind of a, a map of the location of these uh, of this antenna array and, and showing also relatively the locations of the uh, the 12 meter and the SMT uh, telescopes. Um, so <clears throat> in terms of what we have conducted in terms of our measurements here, as I mentioned, we, we kind of did uh, measurements at both the uh, 12 meter as well as the uh, SMT telescope. Um, the, at the 12 meter, um, this is the closer one, this is the Kitt Peak telescope. Um, at this point, we primarily looked into scanning for the interference. So this is what you see here is basically uh, the telescope measuring, uh, the telescope receiver on the left here measuring uh, using a position switching mode. Uh, basically, the telescope is focused, um, you know, at some, you know, interesting uh, phenomena. Uh, that's kind of the on period. Then it goes off by by changing the angular um, orientation very slightly, and then goes back to on. Uh, this is basically the way that these measurements are often conducted to to calibrate them and um, you know so the quantity here on the y-axis is basically uh, an expression that is used to identify if there's some significant phenomena and in this case what is shown here is there's some significant interference uh, showing uh, at about six gigahertz if Remember, this telescope is operates at you know above 66 gigahertz. So, but when it's down, when the signal is down converted, it appears in the IF. Uh, in here, it's we're it's appearing at the center frequency of uh, six gigahertz, uh, with the bandwidth span of about 200 megahertz. So, uh, when we look, when we looked at the you know the what is what is appearing in the spectrum analyzer, we see here. Uh, a clear interference happening at 5.93 to 5.96 uh, gigahertz and at uh, 6.02 to 6.05 gigahertz. Um, and you could see the kind of the peak due to this, uh, this type of interference. This was not a controlled source of interference. So actually it, it's still a mystery where this interference is coming from. Um, and, um, you know, looking at even, you know, different um, uh, mode of the telescope, the upper side band, uh, diff other, you know, different channels. Again, the interference is persisting there. Um, and even conducting the same experiment uh, as late as actually two days ago, this is February 10th, uh, the same interference is still quite present here and the same band, the same, you know, 30 megahertz bands uh, around the six gigahertz region. Um, this is basically the kind of the setup for uh, this, this measurement. You'll see here the 12 meter telescope here. And what you see here on the right is we have the um, uh, uh, spectrum analyzer connected to a, a horn antenna uh, where we can kind of control the orientation of the antenna and, and you know, take the, these measurements that you see here in the slide. So, um, um, even when we change the uh, direction of the horn antenna and changing or looking at different uh, polarization, different orientation of the horn antenna, we still see this interference showing up. So this is the for the V polarization. And this is back to the H polarization, but looking at a different azimuthal direction to also see that there is an interference. Now, next thing we did as, as part of the study is to well, try to assess, well, if there's a, if there's a Wi-Fi transmission that is controlled, controlled meaning in terms of its transmit power, in terms of its orientation, uh, in, in, you know, in, you know could, could, could there be a, you know, this interference, could it show? Uh, in this case, we switched actually to the SMT, which probably is better uh, insulated. Um, and we conducted various measurements where you use some USRPs, you know, to create or to synthesize uh, Wi-Fi transmissions, and then measure these, you know, the effect of these transmissions both at the USRP receiver as well as uh, using the, uh, you know, radio, uh, the telescopes uh, receiver. Uh, so the setup, the general setup, we still have not done all of these things yet, but the general setup is this is the 
<coughs> this is the telescope, uh, the SMT. Um, the transmitter can be placed outside, or in some cases might be inside. So these are, you know, three uh, possible locations. I'm showing the both the two inside locations and one outside, and I'll I'll report only on the one uh, where the uh, Wi-Fi transmitter is located about, uh, I think about 100 meter away from the SMT and transmitting directionally. So uh, the VAT here is, this is the Vatican Advanced uh, Technology Telescope, some other telescope here. And this is the USRP transmitter placed here. Um, in the experiment I'm showing, the US, USRP receiver is very much adjacent to the SMT uh, antenna, but not, ex not in inside the apex room. And the goal here was to see, again, the effect of Wi-Fi, different locations, powers, and, and directionality. So here's an example of the experiments that we did where the transmitter is, again, is outside, the receiver is inside. Um, and pictorially, this is where, you know, the setup is to change the transmitter location, different distances. Uh, we don't have lots of flexibility in adjusting the distances, again, because this is on a tribal land and you know, some of, you know, locating the, the, also the transmitters and, you know, different distances is a little bit challenging. So we, we have kind of a finite set of locations where we can place the USRP transmitter. So nonetheless, the, in this experiment, we kind of uh, allow the transmitter to send at a center frequency of 5.2 um, uh, with bandwidth of 20 and, you know, monitoring both from the USRP receiver as well as from the telescope uh, receiver, the impact of these transmissions. Um, so here's uh, the kind of a, a diagram that sh the figures that show basically the placement of the USRP uh, transmitter here, USRP receiver here, and the transmitter was we used a horn antenna with the uh, relatively high gain. Uh, at the receiver, we also used uh, uh, a directional a log periodic antenna uh, to uh, measure the signal. This is connected to another USRP. Um, just to be very careful in terms of, um, you know, not impacting the telescope's uh, receiver, we had to start kind of take baby steps in, in, in these experiments and, and send it uh, limited transmit power. Um, so initially, actually, the transmit power from the USRP transmitter was almost just one milliwatt, but then there was the gain, the antenna gain that kind of beefs it up to about 20 dBm. Uh, these are the scans that we've seen uh, from the, uh, you know, USRP receiver um, before the telescope observation and after the telescope observation, and we can see clearly uh, the Wi-Fi channel appearing here. Uh, there's, you know, uh, the USRP receiver is basically sweeping over, uh, you know, 50, 51 channels, each with 20 megahertz. And one of these channels that you see here in light blue is the one where the USRP transmitter is sending over. Um, interestingly, when we looked at the uh, telescope receiver scans, these are the with position switching mode, um, you know, and seeing what's happening while this transmission is, is well, the USR, the Wi-Fi transmission is taking place. And we looked at different elevations and different filters and so on. Um, so these are elevation of 10 degrees and 30 degrees and two different types of filters. And this is the IF frequency. Uh, the, the, the very clear thing that we, we kind of came up with is that actually at, at, at these transmission powers and distances, there's no Wi-Fi interference coming into the SMT. The distance, again, remember, it's about 83 meters between the USRP transmitter and, 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 and receiver. So, I mean, the plan for us is to kind of continue conducting these experiments and, and try to understand better, you know, at, in what configurations and what uh, scenarios can, uh, you know, Wi-Fi signals coexist uh, with, with uh, you know, radio astronomy uh, uh, telescopes without causing uh, harmful interference. Uh, in terms of, um, and just I'll quickly go over some of our thoughts as to the feasibility of spectrum sharing. Um, you know, um, we all know that the spectrum sharing has been applied below six gigahertz to a number of technologies, active transmitter technologies. Uh, and the key has always been that the key aspect to any successful spectrum sharing paradigm is interference avoidance. 
And the same thing applies here in terms of coexistence with our radio astronomy systems. Now, uh, you know, the typical strategies has been to either time share, this is the, what we call the interleaving model, or to allow them to, you know, be co-channel, but subject to very strict uh, power masks. And I, I call that the underlay model. And in these two cases, the, the directionality aspect is not really uh, taken into account. So what we believe in that, you know, given the, the high directionality of radio astronomy systems and the fact that quite often their transmissions and not always often transmissions are scheduled uh, in advance. Uh, this can be often exploited to allow for uh, coexistence to take place in both time frequency and space, meaning in, in directionality. And that's kind of a core aspect of, of our uh, future plan. Uh, and, and, you know, the, so this schedule based approach would take place as part of a, a spectrum database that accounts for what is known about uh, the schedule of radio astronomy uh, systems, the, uh, you know, the sky frequencies, directionality and, and other aspects and take and, and obviously their sensitivity, uh, taking this all into account in enabling uh, other transmissions to coexist. Um, uh, let me skip these slides and just, um, just you know, maybe one last uh, slide I want to mention about, well, in order for this partnership to work, obviously, the, you know, sharing, you know, the, it has to be beneficial to both wireless and uh, radio astronomy community, and we, are, we, str we strongly believe in this uh, philosophy. So how can spectrum sharing benefit the radio astronomy side? And one thing that we, I, you know, we've heard a lot from radio astronomers is, well, they often have challenges in real-time monitoring or an, an attribution or source attribution of where the RFI is coming from. So this is something that the wireless community can help with. And, and this is part of our uh, agenda here. And also in terms of understanding, well, what is this interference? I mean, classifying interference and, and one can leverage, uh, you know, the previous speakers talked about various machine learning tools that can be used for uh, interference classification. Um, an interesting uh, uh, contribution that can be actually, that can help the radio astronomy community is accommodating these uh, so-called uh, red shifts. These are uh, movements or shifts in the um, um, spectral lines uh, from their rest frequencies due to the Doppler effect and the fact that the universe is continuously expanding. Uh, as a result of that, so a certain observation that let's say no, is known to uh, take, should, should take place at a certain rest frequency, um, you know, based on let's say, you know, quantum mechanics and, and other lab experiments, when conducting the actual measurements, you know, these this observation might shift to a band where radio astronomy does not have primary uh, access to. So this is something where the you know wireless systems can be adapted, and and we know that waveform adaptation is quite commonly used in, in dynamic spectrum access can be adapted to accommodate these spectral lines appearing in an unprotected uh, type of bands. Um, and another uh, you know, important aspect is accommodating adjacent channel interference. You know, given the high sensitivity of uh, radio astronomy measurements, uh, you know, any imperfections in the filters of technologies in adjacent bands will actually cause uh, significant damage to their measurements. So, that's one thing that, that uh, is also an important aspect of, of uh, uh, our research agenda. Um, so just this is my last slide, just wanna mention about uh, our, our plans for doing this uh, real-time RF sensing. Uh, this, is a, a, this is still a tentative plan of where we think you know, sensors could be placed. What you see here is the uh, 12 meter telescope and the uh, Triangles here are just possi possi some possible locations where sensors could be placed. Again, we don't have lots of lecture in terms of placing them anywhere. So these are some of the possible structures, could be buildings that, that uh, U of A has access to, or it could be on the, on the, you know, on the telescope uh, dome itself uh, with the use of possibly some directional, uh, you know, some sensors with directional antennas. So these are some of the you know, possibilities that we are currently exploring to provide real-time sensing uh, for the purpose of detecting interference, but also uh, for the purpose of actually, you know, facilitating the coordination of wireless transmissions by acquiring channel information and using that as, as a way to schedule uh, such transmissions. 
So I'm going to stop here and uh, be happy to take any questions.